Thank you, darling. Everybody in our class. And um, thank you. So that's, so oh, my Bridge University classes starting in September are called the Mystery Kingdom Parables. And the reason it's a mystery is it's because Jesus' prophetic, Jesus's prophetic parables regarding the age of the church. And he speaks in parables. So it's a very fascinating study. And it will be primarily from Matthew 13. And I only have five weeks, so I'll not get it all done. But I'll get, but he's going to let me start, go into October later. So we're going to take September and October, certain months, to finish or to study the kingdom parables. So it's going to be a very interesting study. All right. Ready? This is, this is for you. I'm going to do the red and you'll do the black. But listen first. Jesus Christ is risen. Yeah. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Did I mess that up? We'll go back. Blessed is the one who reads aloud. And blessed are those who hear it. Because... Isn't that exciting? All right. Now, until he returns and takes his church home, until then, we have some specific uh, commandments from the Lord as to what we are to be doing. Peter tells us the one that is above all, above all the commandments, this is what we are to do. Love one another deeply. And that's what I'm excited about in our first 15 minutes of class at 9.30 to 9.45. We're going to love one another. It'll be a time of prayer. If someone needs prayer, this is the time for you to get prayer, to get hands laid on you, to have people praying especially for you. We are to love one another deeply. And? And? And I just, that's been on my heart that we really begin offering hospitality to one another. I'm so glad to see Tanja and Judy back. Good to have you back. Uh, offer hospitality to one another. And last week, two different women came to me and said, you know, there's a person's birthday in this classroom. Well, it's, it's uh, where is Linda? Linda Jones. There you are. And um, Vicki told me, she said, you know, I really am going to start doing that. So she said, uh, we're going to take Linda out for her birthday, you and she and Cheryl. I think that is so neat. And then, um, and then uh, Mari, Car Mari, raise your hand. Mari said, I'm going to start doing that too. I'm going to start inviting people to lunch after church. That's really a wonderful thing to do, to offer hospitality to one another. And so make sure you look around, see who's new, because we do have new people in here. And it's a wonderful class. So we are doing Revelation chapter 15. We're going to finish 15 today because I've only covering four verses and it's taken two and a half weeks. So these are wonderful, wonderful verses. But to Revelation chapter 15, to review it, look at your newsletter. That's the one with all the events on it. And it's entitled, Hold Firmly to the Word of Life. And we're going to do the bottom part of it where it says our current unit of study. And we're looking at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just because I'm a teacher, I want, you to, I want to show you something. Look at the word revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Be very careful when you speak about the book of Revelation that we don't add an S to the end. It's one revelation. It's not revelations, but we think it is, but it isn't. It's one revelation, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. And so practice saying that. And so we're looking at Revelation 15 verses 1 through 4. This is important for you to know as you read the book of Revelation. And that is that we are told many, many things. And then John will stop his, his account and he will begin to tell us, give us what is called an interlude. It's a parenthetical passage. 
And that parenthetical passage will tell us what's going on at the same time that the other events are going on. So I'm going to show you some interludes today and I hope, here's what my hope is for you also, that you have, are starting to go back and to read the book of Revelation with the knowledge that we have now. Understanding the interludes because if you don't understand that these particular passages are interludes, further explanation further events going on at the same time that was happening in the preceding chapters. It makes it a whole lot easier to understand. So Revelation chapter 15 is an interlude and it's right between this announcement, announcement, announcement of the seventh trumpet and the bowls of judgment. And so John just stops and he says, by the way, Let's see what's happening in heaven. And he shows us a picture of heaven and the sea of glass. And we see people worshiping God. So let's look at that. It's happening at the same time. Uh, this is the time of comfort and blessing for God's people. So you'll see that on your uh, newsletter. Revelation chapter 15 is an interlude. Put, if you want to, an interlude is a parenthetical passage. It's an interlude of uh, comfort and blessing for God's people just before the third woe. Now, how many of you are kind of new and haven't been here in a while? Okay. Kirk, that is not true. <laughs> Kirk, you're here every Sunday, honey. <laughs> Maybe your mind is gone. So I'll ask the question again. If you're kind of new, or you haven't been in here in a while, we have studied the third woe. So here's what I want you to know. The three woes. Don't worry. I'll do it again. So when, I, when people come to our class and you're new, and you think you're behind, well, you would have to start 20 years ago, and you can't do that, right? So just jump in. Just jump in with us into the scriptures. Just jump in and I will reteach it, I promise, right? So here's, so the third woe is what's going to happen just in a moment. The third woe is the worst of times in all of history of mankind. So we looked so far at three groups of people in this lesson. So this is letter A, the three groups of people in chapter 15. And then we went back also to chapter 4. Who's the first group of people in chapter 15 that we studied? The unbelievers. That's right, the unbelievers. These are the people who have taken the mark of the beast. And the third woe is falling upon them. And the angel tells John they need to be ready. So it's the unbelievers. The second group that we see in chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, are whom? The martyrs. We also call them the tribulation saints. These are the people who stand strong on their testimony of Jesus Christ in spite of what they know is going to happen to them. They know they're going to die. So we meet them and they're in heaven and they're singing. Isn't that wonderful? So that's the t second group of people. And then in chapter 4, we looked at the, glass of, uh, the glass, sea of glass. And we met a third group of people. And that was whom? The church. The raptured saints. That will be you and that will be me. Standing by the side of the sea of glass. Or maybe on the sea of glass. Worshiping God. So these are the three people, groups of people, we have studied in this in this current lesson. All right, we also talked about, now this is number two, two descriptions of a sea. A sea of what? Glass. John says it's like crystal. Now remember, this is a simile. It isn't a sea of glass in front of God's throne. It's what? like a sea of glass. Y'all are good. It's a simile. It's like a sea of glass. It's reflected. Every, everything in, in the environment of this floor is reflecting. And so we read about two, uh, the two descriptions of the sea of glass. The first one is in Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. And it's a sea of glass that what? 
reflects, reflects rays of fire. And we studied last week that probably those rays of fire represent the martyr's persecution, the terrible persecution, the terrible fire, that, so to speak, that they went through on earth before they got to heaven because that's the group that we're talking about in Revelation chapter 15 are the martyrs. And so they're standing by the sea of glass and it reflects this prisms of prism of light and fire. Well, Revelation chapter 4 uh, also tells us about the sea of glass, but it isn't reflecting any fire. And standing beside the sea of glass in this picture are the church saints, the raptured saints. But the sea is no longer radiating this fire. It's a placid sea. It's a very peaceful sea. And what are they doing? What does it symbolize? Their, their rest. The church, the church is at peace. The church is at rest. There's no more sorrow. There's no more, no more sadness. No more tears. The church is at rest. So that placid sea in that picture that John saw represented, represented the peace and the rest of the raptured church. And in that chapter, verses 1 through 4, we also see two songs. And last week I thought it was really special. In fact, I heard from a lot of you about that lesson. So if you didn't hear it, go on YouTube and listen to it. How many of you are listening to the lessons on YouTube? Lots of people are. Good. I'm glad you are, Judy. Did you listen to last week's lesson yet? I just sent it to you. In fact, the first 15 minutes of class from 9.30 to 9.45, if you don't know how to call up these YouTube lessons, see somebody in class and we'll help you do it. Okay? Because you should just be able to click on your, on your YouTube and it should come up. Do you do that? You do. All right. I just learned how to do it. We've been doing this for three years. Chase finally showed me how to do it on my phone. Thank you, Chase. All right. Two songs. The first one is the Song of Moses. Where does the Song of Moses sung the first time? Coming out of Egypt. What's the chapter? Exodus 15. Very good. And so let's look at page 228, if you have it. Um, Jill. What's your name, Jill? So glad to meet you. And I'm Kathleen. You don't have page 228. So, can you share with her, Monica? Oh, hey, Kirk. Kirk never fills his papers out. So that's not true. He does. Okay. I want you to look at page 228, Roman numeral 2. If you were here last week or the week before, you should have it. For the words of the refrain of the Song of Moses. And it's um, up here as well. Are you there on page 228? All right. It says, the Lord, this is what Moses said, the Lord is my what? Strength. My strength and my song. How many of you have ever needed to remember that? That, the, that God is our strength. God is our song. And he has become my salvation. He is my God. Now listen about this. Moses is singing this song 3,500 years ago. He sang this 1,500 years before Christ. And we are still singing that song today. I will praise Him. He is my Father's God and He's our God as well. And I will exalt Him. So let's listen to this song. You ready? Uh, lights and turn it up real loud, babe. Would you please? Thank you, Doug, back there.
Cheryl, thank you very much for sure. Oh, I think we need to sing that some more. <laughs> the youth loved it. All right. And if you want to Google it, it's I it's that's the title. I will sing unto the Lord. Thank you, Cheryl. All right, now page two twenty eight. The martyrs will also sing the song of the Lord. All right? He's, they're also going to, they sang the song of Moses, and then on page 228, they're going to sing the song of the Lord, and here is their song. Are you ready? Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. When we describe the works of God, what two adjectives can we use? Great and marvelous are his deeds. Just and true are his ways. So we can't say that was unfair to God. Can we? Because the scriptures tell us his ways are just and true. So number th verse uh, number one on, and letter B on page 228, we're going to find that when the, when the um, marchers sing this song, they don't have a, a bitter spirit within them at all. In fact, they don't say uh, to themselves and to other people, why did God allow this to happen? You ever heard anybody say that? How does a loving God allow this to happen? You've heard that, haven't you? And I don't know. I don't know why God, who is a loving God, allows bad things to happen. There's right up here, Tiffany and Gary. We're so, and here right up here, Tiffany and Gary. We're so glad you're here. Everybody say hello to Tiffany and Gary. We've been missing you. Love you guys. All right. When people say, how could a loving God let such a terrible thing happen? Our answer is, we don't know. Right? But here's what we do know. And I like to say that sometimes because there are a lot of questions that we don't have. In fact, 2 Timothy tells us, great is the mystery of God. We don't understand most of his ways. We don't understand his sovereignty. But here is what we do know, that his ways are marvelous. His, his works are marvelous. His ways are true. That's what we do know. And what, and what a, what a um, statement of faith that is, isn't it? Because when these martyrs are going to be in, on earth during the tribulation, they're going to be facing the worst times ever. But yet they are saying this, great and marvelous are the works of God. Just and true are your ways. That's what we should be saying as well. That is our statement of faith when people ask us those questions. What words of faith? Number two on letter B is the, uh, the rest of the song of the Lamb. Now this is beautiful. And I really didn't appreciate it until I really began to study this. Because they're making two statements in this verse. King of the nations, the ages, who will not fear you, Lord? Who will not bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. And what they're saying here is that they recognized his sovereignty, or they will recognize his sovereignty. The ways of God are holy. He is a holy God. Everybody will fear him. He alone is holy. So he is a sovereign God. He is the God of the ages. He's the God of the nations. I've been studying Romans 13. Anybody know what Romans 13 is about? our responsibility to our government. And if anybody needs to be studying that right now, it is Christians. What is our responsibility to our nation? What is our responsibility to God? 
And so Romans 13 is a great study. And I'll bring you a book I have. It's written in the 1950s. And I'm going to share it with Pastor because it really helps us to begin to th realize what we need to be doing. We are law, listen carefully, we are law abiding citizens. We obey the laws of our country. We pay our taxes. We can criticize though because that's our right, isn't it? And here's when we listen carefully. The scriptures teach us that God is sovereign he is the God of the nations. He established nations so that we could have civil and religious freedom. That's why he established it. Civil law. And the only thing that we don't respond to is tyranny. A tyrannical government taking our freedom away to do what God says to do. Now in Romans 13, it talks about that. And the context of government for Christians, the whole context in Romans 13 is love. Because before you get to chapter 13, chapter 12 ends with the word love. After he talks about government, he continues in love. So our job, our job, whatever we do, is to do it in love. That kind of helps, doesn't it? But when the government says to me, you will worship government, you will worship this image, you will worship this person, then what is my responsibility? Say no. I can't do that. And how do we say no? In love. In love. No vengeance. We do it in love. That's chapter 13 of Romans. Now how did I get to that? Oh, God's the one who established the nations. He did that. So that we could, have, we could have peace in our world. Without government, we don't have peace, do we? So he gives us the constraints of a Christian in, in the government. And that's what we'll be talking about also in the mystery kingdoms. Because he's talking about the world today. So it all ties together. These martyrs recognize the sovereignty of God. Or they will, and they do. That he is the God of the nations. That he established the nations. They will obey the laws until, until they, def they defy God's rules. So they recognized his sovereignty. They recognized God as the God of the ages. The God of history. The God of us. Our God. So this is what they were doing in this verse. And look what else they said. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. In the first part of the verse, they're recognizing God's sovereignty over the nations. All right? In this part of the verse, they are expecting something to happen. What is their expectation in this part of the verse? Nations will come and worship before you. Has that happened yet? Has that happened that nations come before God and worship Him? It hasn't happened. So what is the expectation? That He is coming. That He is coming. Listen, Jesus is coming back. And He's going to set up His kingdom. And all nations, all nations will come and worship before him. What a great expectation. And listen, what great hope the martyrs are going to have when they read this verse. Because they know just very, very soon Jesus is coming back to earth. They know that the martyrs during the tribulation it will be less than three years when he's coming again. So this is a great expectation that they had of the coming kingdom of the Messiah. And they recognized his righteous judgment. And we're going to look at his righteous judgment. Um, okay, so look at chapter 15 in your Bible, verses 1 through 4, because we're going to listen to this. Chapter 15, Revelation chapter 15, we're going to hear this song. It's another song of Moses, but it takes the whole uh, passage, this, the um, song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Are you ready? 
There we go. Turn it up, babe. like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious. They held harps given them by God, and they sang the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. you father that you are our God just as you were the God of Moses just as you will be the God of the martyrs during the tribulation you are the same God and we worship you and we exalt you for you are our strength our song and our salvation and may we continue to meditate on these words and it's in Jesus name Amen. 
You know, I think Jesus showed John this interlude uh, of comfort and hope so that his readers, you and I, will pause and think about what God has done through Jesus Christ for the world. And here's a question I want to ask you. Have you thought of the song you want to sing in heaven? And we've heard the song of the saints. We've heard the song of the martyrs. We hear the praising of the angels. And I thought, well, what song am I going to sing? You ever thought about it? What song do you want to sing when you get to heaven in praise of Jesus? And, and I just heard this song recently. I think it was Pastor, uh, I'm not sure it was or not. It may have been Pastor McGee's services, I don't know. But it was for what earthly reason? For what earthly reason did God send his son to earth? What? That's right. Save you. To save Alice. That's it. And uh, would you like to hear that song? What? Oh, very good, Mary. I was hoping somebody would say, save you too, right? All right, so he was sent his son to be rejected and to die on a cross. This is the song I'm going to sing to Jesus. Lights. Then we'll do some Bible study. For what earthly reason Can't you hear me singing this? Would the heaven Send down his son to suffer rejection and pay for crimes he had not done. For what earthly reason would the father? that beautiful so you, we'll play that again next Sunday morning but listen John put this interlude in the book of Revelation for praise and comfort and this is the, these are the songs that they're singing in heaven of praise and comfort and so what John is doing in chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 is stopping and saying look in the midst of all of this, here, are, here is some comfort and here's some hope. Here is a reason why you should be praising God. Isn't that wonderful? Because right now we're going to look at the next set of judgments. And it's going to be a terrible, terrible time. And so God not only wants to, to comfort the people who will be going through this, 
but he wants to comfort you and me as we look to this time. So we're going to be looking at um, page 229 and we're looking at the day of the Lord. Listen carefully. Yes, ma'am. On page 228, number three. Okay, everybody needs to go back to that. I'm going to go with that real quickly. Number three, page 228, letter A. When else did the people of Israel sing the song of Moses? This is really interesting. They sang the song of Moses the first time, 3,500 years ago. This is page 228, letter Roman numeral two, letter A, number three. They sang it 3,500 years ago when they crossed the Red Sea on dry land. Number, letter A, when else did they do it? A letter, at the dedication of Solomon's temple, they sang this song. Great and marvelous are your works. Just and pure are your ways. You are my salvation. You are my God. You are my Father's God. You are my praise and my song. At Solomon's temple. That was about 900 B.C. Okay? Solomon's temple was dedicated about 900 B.C. Some 400 years later, they were taken into Babylon, into captivity. They sang it as they came back. That's in five, uh, 539 B.C. At their return from exile in Babylon. How's that, Teresa? 539 B.C. Now let's go back to where we were. Anybody else have any questions before I go back to where I was going? <laughs> Do what? I'm sure I'm not. Page 228, letter B, number 3. They anticipated the soon coming kingdom of Messiah. And they reckon, what? Is that right? Okay, and they recognize God's uh, righteous judgment. All right. Everybody, you all have to have your notes, don't you? Because we're going to have a major test someday. So you got to have these answers. Okay. Ab no, I do not grade on the curve. You either know it or you don't, right? Okay. The day of the Lord in the scriptures always refers to God's judgment. It refers to the tribulation time. It's a terrible time. Read Joel 2 and you'll read about it. It's the day of his judgment. It also refers to the seven year tribulation. Um, and in this day of the Lord, for seven years, there are three sets of judgments. How many? Three sets of judgments. Each set of judgments has seven events. So it's a terrible time. That's 21 terrible things that will be happening on the earth. These sets of judgments are the seven seals of judgment. That's what we're studying on page 229. We'll get that done in a few minutes. Uh, then we're going to next week, next week, study the seven trumpet judgments. You need to review this. You must know these to help you understand the seven bowl judgments. All right, so let's look at the seven seals. That's on page 229. Let's review the seven seals of Revelation chapter 6. Okay. Okay, I need some more laugh than that. When I was teaching young children, we were talking... One little boy was telling me about the seals of Revelation. And he really thought these were the seals. So we had to take some time. And, honey, turn the lights out. This is really a cute picture. Um, when we talk about the seven seals. And so that is not what we're talking about. Isn't he cute? That's not what we're talking about. The seven seals. Thank you, lights. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Uh, John in chapter 6 or five, saw a scroll, and it was sealed. And it wasn't just sealed with one little seal, a little stamp. It had seven seals 
on it. And nobody could open this seal. In fact, John actually cried because no one was worthy to open this scroll. No one was worthy to break any one of these seals so that he could read what was inside the scroll until he was told uh, only the, until he was told that the lion of judgment was worthy to open the seal or it was also called the lamb of god the lamb of god was worthy to open the seal these are the two pictures that we see of jesus in his first coming he is the lamb in the second coming he will be what the lion of judgment and only he is worthy to open this scroll why because it is his, his judgment so he is the lamb of god uh, he is the lion of judgment so when is he going to open these scrolls this scroll and break these seals when at the day of judgment that's right and so here are the seven seals. And so we're just going to look at that on Roman numeral one, page 229. Uh, by the way, number them on your paper. The what? Excuse me, the white horse is number one. Put a one up there so you don't forget, so you know what seals we're talking about. These are not seals like little animals. Okay, the, the four, so first four seals are horses. And so number those from one to seven above. And let's look quickly at these. They represent judgment on the earth. So we've numbered them one to seven. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter six. We're gonna go through this really fast because this is the third time I've taught it. So uh, you can go back into your notes if you want your notes. We can even go back into YouTube and find these lessons. So your book is open to Revelation chapter 6. And that is where the seals are opened. He has broken those seals. And so these seals, this judgment will occur in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Jesus called those three and a half years what? Yes, the beginning of sorrows. They occur in those three and a half years of the beginning of sorrows. Each seal, Jesus opened each seal and it revealed a new judgment. Now, let's look at those judgments. Seals numbers one, two, three, and four. They're all what? Horses. These are called the horsemen of the apocalypse. We have found boxers that call themselves the horsemen of the apocalypse. There are music groups called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Uh, judges call themselves the Horsemen of the Apocalypse. But this is the real apocalypse horsemen. So we're looking at the riders, not uh, the riders on these horses, what's important. The horses represent something, but the riders bring in the judgment, all right? So the rider on the white horse, this is... Number three, letter A, the rider on the white horse represents the Antichrist. Jesus comes on a white horse also in chapter 19. The Antichrist is a false Christ. He's an imitator, right? And so he comes on a white horse also. He comes with a bow, which means he's a conqueror. But he has no arrows, meaning he's coming in what? Peace. But we find that it is a false peace. So that's the rider on the white horse. It's the Antichrist. So the Antichrist will be, will be revealed at the very beginning of those seven years of tribulation. Let me ask you a question. What is the sign that we will know, we're not going to be here, but the sign that the world will know, this is the Antichrist. What's the sign, Kevin? Yes, the peace treaty that he signs with Israel and her enemies. That happens first. And it turns out to be a very false peace. Because let's look at letter B, the rider on the red horse. The rider on the rep red horse 
represents worldwide war. So it wasn't, it wasn't peaceful very long, was it? It's red because red in the Bible and most everywhere else represents bloodshed. So it's going to be a terrible time of war. Look at the third horse. What color is the third horse? Black. When there is worldwide war, when there's war anywhere in the world, Africa is full of inter-tribal inter wars. You know what follows war? Famine. What follows famine? Starvation. What follows people, the population when they're hungry and they're weak from starvation? What comes next? Pestilence and disease. And that's what this horse, the rider on the black horse, represents. Famine. Starvation and pestilence. He carries with him a scales. And everything, the inflation at this time during these three and a half years will be unbelievable. I'm going to use Margot's favorite word. Unprecedented. Unprecedented inflation. Because there's such a shortage. A person will have to work a whole day, according to the book of chapter 6 of Revelation, a whole day for one meal for one person. Terrible, terrible inflation. Famine, starvation, and pestilence. Now there is the last horse. And what color is the last horse? Pale. Uh, some, I think it's the King James Version, I'm not sure. A pale green. What is... What is pale green? It's the color of a putrid uh, fermentation, rot. It's death. The pale horse represents death. And following this horse, this rider on the, white, on the pale horse, is another horse. But it's not one of them. Who's on the other horse following uh, death? Hell. Death and Hades. Death and hell. Followed, death is followed on another horse by Hades. Now, are these scary pictures or not? Can you see why we need to be talking to our loved ones about what's coming? Don't be shy anymore. You know so much. Don't be shy about what's coming because we would all want our kids to, so, to have to experience this. That's riders one through four. The horses, the riders... Uh, on the, what's it called? Help me again. Horseman of the Apocalypse. There we go. Number four is seal number five. That's the souls crying out. Who, what souls are these? The martyrs. They're in heaven. They've been killed in these three and a half years. They're martyred. And, and the picture shows them under the altar of mercy. And they're crying out to God. And you know what they're crying? How long? How long, Lord, are you going to let this happen? And you know what God says? You know what he says to you when we say how long? Wait. Just wait. Just wait. My time is perfect. Just wait. He says wait because there are more people yet to die in the, revel in the tribulation. So, that's what they are doing. And he's saying, wait. Alright, uh, their cry is how long? Number five, the seal. Number six, uh, as you can see, that there will be a great earthquake and celestial events that we've not seen before. The sun, the moon, and the stars will be doing different things. So that's the sixth seal. Questions? Do you want to be here and see all of this? No. Do you have to be here? No. Is Jesus coming soon? Yes. yes. And many, many people will be left. Let's not be responsible for any one of them being left that we haven't told about Jesus Christ. So that's number one, letter A, one through five. Anybody have any questions on that? I just taught a whole couple of lessons here. But you remember it. Kathy? The number six would be entitled then. A great earthquake and unprecedented celestial events. Did I get it? Okay. All right. Now let's look uh, at verses 15 through 18. 
the response of the earth dwellers. All these horrible things are happening. They're happening. And so what do the people on earth say? Well, I'm thinking, if it were I, I would be begging God to take me out of the world, wouldn't you? Let's see what they said. Then the kings of the earth. This is chapter 6, verses 15 and 7, 16 and 17 and 18. The kings of the earth. That's the powerful people. The princes. That's their helpers. The generals, the military, the rich, the mighty. Look at all the people here now that we're talking about. These are the people on the earth. What are they going to do? And everyone else. We're that everyone else, are we? When we're talking about the rich and the mighty. Here's what they do. Both slave and free. They hid in caves. And among the rocks of the mountains, they called to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. Who is that? Who sits on this throne? Hide us from him. Hide us from God and also from what? The wrath of the Lamb. Who was that? Jesus. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? What's the answer to that question? No one. So, is there any sign of repentance? Wouldn't you think there would be? No sign of repentance. In fact, they would rather die. They called for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. They would rather die than turn to God and repent. That's a hard heart, isn't it? So that's uh, number one letter B. All right? The response of the people on earth? No what? No repentance. They would rather do what? Die. I know people like that. Do you? I know people like that and I don't understand that. All right. Open your Bibles to chapter 7. We've just done chapter 6. The, the seals. Chapter 7 is the interlude. Put in, on your chart on page 229 a great big line between the 6th seal and the 7th seal because that's the interlude or you can put parentheses there okay put a line in there um, because um, it's a time where John is going to see some other events happening and that's chapter 7 how did I not get done how could that happen <laughs> you want me to fill it out for you? Yes. Okay, here's the interlude. I'm just going to tell you. Number one, the purpose of the interlude is to introduce the reader to two groups of people. All right? This is chapter 7. So when you read the Bible in Revelation, when you get to chapter 7, remember, this is the interlude. It's an explanation of what's going on between uh, b during all those six seals, okay? This is when, letter A, there will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be called by God and sealed. They'll have the name of God on their forehead. And they go out to the whole world preaching the gospel. That's happening during the six seals. That's why he puts the interlude there. Right, nod your head if you understand that what the purpose of this interlude is. Micah does. Okay? He's telling us, well, during these six seals, 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be called out. And secondly, um, there will be an innumerable multitude of Gentile believers. Millions of people are going to be saved. Even though the scriptures are telling us that a whole lot of them aren't. Most of them aren't. But a, a multitude of... Um, Let's see. There we go. A multitude of Gentile believers will be saved. Isn't that exciting? Now, we will start next week with the seven trumpets. That's Revel letter D. The seventh seal, there is silence in heaven. Can you imagine? And it tells us it's like for an hour. Wasn't it for an hour? Silence in heaven. Can you imagine all the noise and singing and stuff we've been seeing going on in heaven? And now there's silence. God is saying to heaven and to the martyrs, 
get ready. The trumpet judgments are coming. And they're even worse than the first judgments. So letter D, the seventh seal, silence in heaven in preparation for the next set of judgments. What are those judgments? Trumpet. The trumpet judgments. And I did get finished. <laughs> Thank you. Mary? You knew that, Mary. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, listen. At the bottom letter E, go into the YouTube, go into YouTube and Google what are the seven seals of Revelation. And you can get a whole lesson on it if you want to. Or find mine on YouTube as well. Questions? Next week, we, okay, listen. Next week we have no class. The next week we will do the seven trumpets and get into the seven bowls. All right? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful class. Let us all be thinking of the song we want to sing to you and Jesus when we get to heaven. What a day that will be. And in the meantime, Lord, thank you for the comfort and the hope you've given us. Thank you for our love for one another and our hospitality toward one another. And we give you the glory. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for letting me be your teacher.